All right, can we welcome Elisa together? Thank you so much. It's been such a joy to get to be with you all uh, all day with most of you and with the students. Man, you have some amazing, sharp, polite, incredibly awesome students. So that is a direct reflection of you guys. And I got to tell you, really impressed, for real, really impressed today. Um, so I, I just want to share with you for a little bit about, um, you know, all of you are teaching this Gen Z generation, right? This is like a whole new animal. Gen Z are kids basically 21 and under about right now. So that's right in the heart. That's where my kids are at. I have a 13-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old little boy. And um, it's just an entire, it's like you, every generation says that about the next one. It's like this generation, you know, these kids these days. But uh, we, I think we really do have a unique sort of generation rising up in the way that they interact with the world. And so just with the few things I've learned along the way, I want to share some of those things with you. I'd also like to share with you what I think um, from a spiritual standpoint are going to end up being the biggest challenges for Gen Z. Um, and they already are, but especially as they go off to college and as they interact more with the world online. I, I want to share what a, a few of those things are. So this is going to be a little bit informal. I'm not going to be giving a formal presentation, so I'm going to be jumping between things a little bit. Uh, but I want to start by just sharing with you some research. You, you may all be aware of a lot of the research that's been done lately um, with this generation, but let me see if I can get my little clicker thingy working. Here we go. So uh, three independent surveys. Oh, I got to open one more thing, guys. I'm so sorry. I'm a little tired. Hang on. I, gotta, I, I, I have some notes here I need to open up super quick. Give me one second here. Okay, so have you, you've all heard of the youth exodus. Have you heard of that? The youth exodus. So the youth exodus is basically some studies were done, and they're indicating that 45 to 48% of youth leave the church after their freshman year in college and never return, right? So some of you might have heard the number, uh, even upwards of 95% of Christian kids leave the faith after high school. Has, have you all heard that number? Well, that's a little bit deceptive in that a lot of those kids end up coming back to church. They get married, they have kids, they want to provide that for their kids. So they, a lot of those end up coming back. So 45 to 48% at this point are the ones who are leaving and, and never return. Now, that's almost half of our kids. And so, you know, what, what is happening? And, and I think a lot of people are doing some great work to try to, to figure out what is happening with that. David Kinneman reported that after the age of 15, 60% of Christians had disconnected from their churches. Uh, many of these describing themselves as spiritual but not religious, or the nuns. Have you heard the term the nuns? These are a whole generation of kids who are not going into atheism. They're not leaving Christianity to say, hey, we're materialists now. We believe that the only things that exist are uh, matter and physical uh, properties. They're not saying that. They're saying, no, there's something to the whole spiritual thing. It's just we're, just, we're not religious. They're rejecting that label of religious. And uh, in 2015... A term was coined called therapeutic moralistic deism. And what this was, was a, um, a study done from American teenagers. This wasn't specifically, to my knowledge, done on just Christian American teens, but just American teens. And they were basically asked a lot of questions about what they thought the nature of spirituality is. And basically, the, the reason this term was coined is the therapeutic part came from the fact that most American teens kind of felt like God was like a giant therapist in the sky, that uh, just, you'll be there if you need something, but he's not going to really tell you who you should or shouldn't sleep with. He's not going to get all up in your finances or, or decisions you make regarding other things in your life. But if you need something, he'll be there. You can talk to him. So that would be the therapeutic part. The moralistic part comes from the fact that most of these teens reported that they 
basically thought God just kind of wants them to be good and be nice to each other. And, and by being good, of course, that would never cross into um, areas of morality involving sexuality or gender or anything like that, but more just like good, like be nice. God God, God will be there for you, be nice. But the deism part, uh, deism is a worldview that would say essentially that God did create, or the, some kind of a God created the universe, but then sort of stepped back and is not imminently involved in it anymore. And the, it's sort of compared sometimes to someone winding up a watch and then just letting the watch run out. So essentially what therapeutic moralistic deism gives you is a giant therapist in the sky that wants you to be nice to each other, but he's really not going to butt into your business if you don't want him to. And that's the perception that most American teens, at least by 2015, had. And so uh, I want to go over here to, to show you some of these independent surveys, uh, what they showed about teens. So three independent surveys about Christian teens showed that 41% were uncertain whether Jesus was physically resurrected. And remember, these are Christian teens, not just American teens in general. 63% didn't believe Jesus to be the son of the true one true God. Of uh, Christian teens, 44% believed the Bible to be just one of many authoritative voices about Jesus. And uh, only 33% believed that Jesus, uh, I think that's supposed to say, oh no, th okay, sorry, 33% believed that Jesus is not the only way to heaven. So 33% of American Christian teens believed that there's other ways uh, to go to heaven. Jesus isn't the only way. Only 5% of these teens studied the Bible daily, and that's down 8% since 1991. And a growing majority believe that the Holy Spirit is only a symbol of God's presence or power rather than a person of the Trinity. We can thank Star Wars for that one, I think. 60% are uncertain, unsettled, or confused about whether the Bible can be trusted. And 70% express persistent measurable doubts that what the Bible says about Jesus is true. Now, this, this can seem kind of depressing, right, these, these statistics, but I think that if you compare what they're saying, and then we, we also add to it some more recent research that's been conducted by Impact 360 and Barna Research on this generation of Gen Z, I think we're going to see a picture emerging about just a better way to approach Gen Z. And I'm still figuring it out, honestly. My kids surprise me every day. I mean, the questions they are asking are totally different than the questions I was asking when I was their age. Uh, one example for you is that when I was a kid and I would read through the Bible, I remember reading through the story of Moses leading the Israelites across the Red Sea. And my questions were like, what was that like? Did the walls of water go up on the sides like in the movie and you could see fishes going around or was the ground wet or was it dry? Uh, how long did it take them to get across? Those were the questions I had. When I first read that story to my daughter, her first question was, did that really happen? And that is a radical difference, right? And part of the reason for this is that Gen Z is growing up in a culture that has accepted a worldview called postmodernism. Now, postmodernism is something that they're just catching from culture. It's sort of the default worldview if they don't critically think about their worldview. And I have to actually challenge postmodernism even in my own kids every day because, uh, I, I mean, I'm an apologist. You'd think that I'd be on that, right? <laughs> but, but it gets in there. And basically, postmodernism is marked by two things. It's marked by hyper-skepticism, and it's marked by relativism, or in, in many cases, moral relativism. And so moral relativism is an approach to truth that basically just says what's true for you is true for you, what's true for me is true for me, live your truth, I'll live my truth, live and let live, we're not gonna judge each other, we're not gonna tell each other we're wrong, you do you and I'll do me. That, that in, a, in a nutshell, is moral relativism. I'm not going to tell you that what you're doing is morally wrong, and I expect you not to tell me what I'm doing is morally wrong, because this generation and postmodernism in general has moved morality into the category of preference or opinion. 
Okay? And the other thing that marks postmodernism is a hyper skepticism. And it might seem kind of strange. It did to me when I, re when I was reading about this. I thought that's kind of strange for hyper skepticism, which you'd almost think that would be coming from a position of truth. Like, I want to know what's true and I'm, I'm going to doubt what you say. But they're also relativists. How does that make sense? Well, the hyper skepticism manifests less as a pursuit of truth, which like an honest skepticism would look like somebody taking a belief they grew up with, examining whether or not they believe that belief is, or they believe that proposition is true, maybe saying, I'm skeptical of the sources here, I'm gonna check those, but ultimately, I want to land on truth. That would be an, a, an honest skepticism. I think that would be a healthy skepticism that I would encourage people uh, to be skeptical in that way. But a hyper skepticism is marked by Man, it doesn't matter what you say, I'm going to find the hole in it. I'm going to wiggle out of it. I'm going to figure out a way to, to make sure that doesn't get nailed down with certainty. That's hyperskepticism, and that's the markers of postmodernism. Now, postmodernism goes back to the 60s. There were some philosophers that, that uh, came out of different places in the world. There, there was um, Jacques Derrida, who is often called the father of deconstruction. Now, Derrida was dealing more with the deconstruction of language and of words. So he didn't believe that words could be pinned down to singular meanings. So essentially, the, the intent of the author didn't have any more weight than the, what the interpreter heard or interpreted for themselves. Now, a, a great way to expose this in your kids, I, I did this to my daughter, and she's not here, so she won't know I'm telling you this story. But she, they're getting this from everywhere. She loves Marvel, Marvel movies. And apparently in one of the Marvel movies, and I don't remember this, and I've seen them all, but Spider-Man says something like, somebody said something about words, and Spider-Man said, oh, words are, words are all made up. And so my daughter, like, grabbed that, and I was talking to her one day, and she was like, Mom, words are all made up. They don't have meaning. And I just, like, I, I don't know, the Lord, the Holy Spirit <laughs> gave me this thing, and I said to her, oh, okay. Well, if that's true, then what you just said, thank you so much, because I heard you say you're going to come home after school and do all the dishes and clean the kitchen for me. Thank you so much. And she was like, what? And I was like, well, I mean, if words are just made up and they don't really have any significant meaning or it doesn't matter what the person saying it meant, then I get to interpret it however I want. So great, I'll leave the dishes in the sink for you when you get home. You know, and of course she was a good sport about it. She kind of laughed it off, but the point was made. And I think there are creative ways that we can poke holes in the postmodern uh, worldview of our the Gen Z kids in our lives, and that's going to be elementary, middle, and high school right now. Um, another way, and we talk about some of this in the Mama Bear Apologetics book, and for all you guys in the room, I'll just tell you, um, I, I can say this because it's not bragging because I didn't have a ton to do with the book. I just wrote two or three chapters in it, but there was a, just a group of amazingly smart women who came together to write this book, and let me tell you, it's not just for moms. I mean, this is like a Philosophy 101 starter kit, the Mama Bear Apologetics book. So I definitely want to recommend that to you, especially as it, as it um, speaks to how to engage Gen Z for truth. Because um, I think Hillary, our, our general editor, did just such a fantastic job. But in the book, we talk about different tactics. And one of the things we talk about is how to teach critical thinking to this generation. Because that is something that I think this generation really lacks, and it's really just biblical discernment, right? Uh, biblical discernment, I think when I grew up, I grew up in the charismatic tradition, so my understanding of discernment was, it was like this feeling you get, like that person's wrong and I feel it, so that's my discernment talking, you know? And there is a biblical gift of discerning of spirits and people debate about what, are, what all of that is about, but when the Bible talks about discerning things and testing all things and holding fast to what is good, it's talking about measuring everything that is said through the filter of scripture and through the filter of reality, right? And so I think if with our Gen Z kids, if we can get them to start thinking about the nature of truth, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go a long way, first of all, by, in a fun way, poking holes in their postmodernism, but also getting them to think about objective truth 
and also to always be discerning the messages and the things that they're taking in through media and online. And so I think there's three ways that we can do that. Um, number one, teach our kids biblical discernment. I don't let my kids off the hook ever with this, and I'm going to get into that in a second, but I'll tell you what these three are first. Um, teach them to define terms. Our culture is redefining words under our noses, and I mean, if, if, if you haven't seen this in culture, man, I'm telling you, when you, you, somebody goes on Twitter and says, God is love, that doesn't even mean God is love anymore, you know? Or remember those signs that began to pop up on people's lawns that were, these words were refashioned and repurposed with political agendas and all sorts of things. So we got to teach our kids to define terms, define the words that they're using, and then make active discipleship a priority. And as teachers, I just, I grew up in Christian scenario. I went to a Christian grade school. I went to a Christian middle school and high school that was so much like this one, although we did not have this kind of cafeteria. I will tell you that. We had a food truck, okay? You got like a chicken sandwich from the food truck if you were lucky. But uh, beautiful, you know, Christian campus, about eight or 900 students overall, about the same size. Um, and, and I grew up in those types of scenarios. And I can just tell you that I look back, you guys, I hope this encourages you. I thanked, in my first book, I thanked my seventh and 12th grade English teacher in my book, because it was the same guy. He was my seventh grade English teacher and my 12th grade English teacher. He was, the, he was one of those teachers. I just didn't do that good in school. I didn't care. I didn't like school. But he thought I was a good writer, and he made me love writing. He always encouraged when I would write creative stories. And, um, and so I acknowledged him in my book, like, thank you for making me think I could write something. I never thought I was a writer. So the impact that you have, the impact that you, the opportunity for impact that you have on these kids for the rest of their lives is just incalculable. So when we talk about discipleship, that's not just for pastors, that's not just for parents, that's for teachers. You can actively disciple the kids that God has brought into your classrooms, as, as many of my teachers did. I remember so many of them fondly, and a couple not so fondly, if I'm honest. So <laughs> let's dig into teach our kids discernment. Romans 12, 2 tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So discernment is testing everything against scripture. Now, Gen Z is skeptical about scripture. So you got to back up a few steps, right? You have to make the case for why we believe the Bible is the word of God. We, we have to know some things about how do we know we have an accurate copy of the New Testament? How do we know we even have the accurate words of Jesus? How do we know that the people who wrote the New Testament books that we think wrote them really wrote them? Uh, that requires a little bit of intellectual engagement to learn some of that stuff. So when a kid has a question, you're equipped to help them with an answer. But I also want to encourage you, you don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be an apologist. You get these kids every day. You just have to be curious. That's all it takes. If, it, if a kid is like, well, why should I you know, obey the Bible? You have all kinds of opportunities to engage in conversations. And it's, you know what, one of the most powerful things you can say to Gen Z? I don't, I don't know. What a good question. I don't know the answer to that. But I should know. Let's, let's look it up. Let's go on that journey together. Then you can help guide them toward truth as they, as they figure out what they think about it. Because that's the thing about Gen Z is they're this generation, uh, with the, the new Barna research and the Impact 360 research, it's showing there's a lot of trauma that these kids have experienced. They're also the first generation that is very, very open about getting help, getting help for their mental health, getting counseling, therapy. I mean, I don't know how it was where you guys grew up or when you were younger, but that was sort of like um, taboo. When I, you know, if you went to counseling, like, you must be really messed up, you know? Um, but I see that in my own kids. I have a counselor for both my kids, and my daughter calls it therapy, and she loves calling it therapy. And she gets snacks from the therapy kitchen, and she says, Mom, those are for our clients only. You're not allowed in there. She's really, like, she loves it. She's totally into it. And so that, that reflects that generation, though. They're very aware of mental health. 
Um, I believe it was, I don't have the stats right in front of me, but I believe it was something like 60% report by, by in young ages having encountered at least one traumatic event. Um, they're also the dominant worldview among Gen Z is moral relativism. They don't believe that moral values are objective. They think it's a matter of opinion. And so these are the challenges we have. Now, if, think about this, if you have a generation of kids who believe that moral relativism is right or true, then you go say, well, you, you want to live your life by the Bible. That doesn't even compute. So we have to take some steps back and really establish the nature of truth. Truth is a proposition, a statement, or a belief that lines up with reality. We have to, we have to just ingrain truth in, in these kids. And, and then teaching them, even to test whatever they see, just to be thinking critically about it. I watch, you know, we, we kind of take the, the, the um, posture in our home that we're a little bit on the liberal side of what we'll let our kids watch as far as messaging goes. I mean, they're not watching things that are not age appropriate. But, you know, I have Christian friends who are like, we're not doing any Disney movies, we're not doing any Marvel movies. We're opting to go the other route. We're, we're saying, yeah, we'll watch the Disney movies, we'll watch the Marvel movies, but we're going to talk about them. And we ask questions. We say, what, you know, what message does this movie want you to believe? What, what do they want you to go away thinking is good and true and right? And I make my kids tell me that. Um, we'll ask questions like, what do the heroes do? And, and is the behavior of the hero virtuous, actually good? Does that line up with objective morality? What are the bad guys portrayed like? It's very hard for Gen Z to learn how to untie these knots, but if we can get them thinking critically so they're not just taking everything in, but they're actually trying to parse it through, just asking some really good questions can really, really help with that. Philippians 1, 9 through 10 says, It's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. This is our hope for our kids. And then I just have this adorable little picture of the baby because it's so cute. And we're going to talk about the chew and spit method. This is the talk I often give to, to women for the mama bear. So I've got a picture of a mama bear right here. You know, like the, the mama bear idea where, bear, you know, bears are cuddly and cute until you mess with their kids and then you're going to meet her. And you don't want to meet her. And so in the Mama Bear Apologetics book, we have um, a way to think about discernment, right? How to teach kids discernment. I think this is something you can integrate in your classrooms. This is something you can do. And it's the roar method. So it's like chew and spit. Now, chew and spit doesn't mean we take everything in and find what's good and spit out what's bad. But it means with messages, we, we take it and we, we say, okay, if there's something good in this, let's affirm that. That goes a long way, especially with Gen Z. If you can say, hey, you know when Iron Man gives his life for the world? Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, Iron Man dies. But at the end, you know, he gives his life for the whole world. What a great opportunity to say, why do you think that resonates so deeply with people? Why, why does everybody recognize that that's a good thing to do, that he's virtuous for doing that? Why is nobody saying, hey, why didn't Iron Man realize that he's the smartest guy on the planet and he has all this money and he can invent things that can help people for so many more years? He should have let somebody else give their lives. No, because we know that the real story is that the good guy gives his life for the world, right? So there are so many points of connection where we can acknowledge what's good in um, the message, but we got to recognize that message first. That's where we ask those questions. Um, identify which characters and qualities are presented in an attractive way. Pay attention to the traits that are exhibited by the villains and the, and the, the sidekicks and all of that. Um, so part of the biblical process of sanctification is training our appetites to crave what is good and to be repulsed by what is not. And so I think teaching our kids to think critically is, is going to help in their sanctification process. And then the O in the roar is to offer discernment, which means approve the good and reject the bad, right? So try to find the good first. Find the thing that's like, hey, you know, I, I thought that was really a good display of friendship when this happened. But what did you think about when she said, you know, everything you need is already inside of yourself. Let's talk about that. Is that true? And another great little tactic you can do with kids of this age is, 
if they come to you with all the I am enough messages and like I, I am enough for myself and I am just need to find my inner goddess and all this, just ask them to go like pick up a car. Be like, oh, you're not, you can't do it. Like there's something, you, oh, you're not enough to do. You just, there's fun ways that you can show them that they actually aren't self-sufficient. Like we, we have needs, we need a savior. And then A would be argue for a healthier approach. So when we argue for a healthier worldview, we're giving reasons why we affirm that which we say is good and reject that which we say is evil. We need reasons for calling one idea true and another idea a lie. We can't just tear apart someone's worldview and leave it right there. We gotta propose an alternate, right? We have to uh, retain the good elements but place all of the good biblical wisdom in there. So having a biblical worldview and actively teaching our kids what a biblical worldview is and then reinforce that through discussion and discipleship and prayer. And honestly, guys, I'll tell you this. Um, one of the stories that I told this morning, I'm going to unplug this for a second because I'm going to move to a different slideshow for just a second. Uh, one of the stories I told this morning, for those of you who are not here, uh, I, I had a really significant crisis of faith. As an adult, after I was married, I had a new baby. Many of you may have heard a story that something like a kid grows up in a Christian home. They go to church all the time. They're very involved. They love Jesus. They read their Bibles. And then they go off to college. And after a semester of an evolutionary biology class or a philosophy class with an atheist professor, they come home and they're like, I I'm out. I'm not a Christian anymore. Or their faith was rocked and they, went, they go through some kind of serious time of doubt and deconstruction. Well, a very similar thing happened to me, only my faith crisis was not in the walls of a classroom. It actually happened in the pews of a church. And this was a church that went on years later to call itself a progressive Christian church. But a lot of the claims that they were making in this class were the same claims you'd hear on a college campus from an atheist professor. And so this is what caused me to really dig in and try to figure out, why do I believe that the Bible's the word of God? And so um, part of that story is that uh, I want to make you aware, now that we've talked through our Roar message, I want to make you aware of some challenges that I think Gen Z is going to be facing. Um, the first one is what we touched on before. We talked about Jacques Derrida and deconstruction of words. Well, there's a phenomenon today called deconstruction. Have you all heard of the ph phenomenon of deconstruction as it relates to faith? Um, so it's not exactly the same thing as what Derrida was talking about. I think there's a connection, and I'm actually working on a book right now where I'm trying to make that connection, but it's not exactly what they mean. They're not talking necessarily about the deconstruction of words, although they are doing that. Uh, in, they'll take words like incarnation, and those words don't anymore mean Jesus becoming flesh, God in flesh, but it's more of a cosmic reality called the universal Christ or the cosmic Christ. So there's a redefinition of a lot of words. There is that deconstruction of language, but essentially deconstruction is a process a lot of Christians are going through right now where they're systematically dismantling the beliefs that they grew up with but maybe never really critically thought about. And in most cases, they're discarding those beliefs. And some people deconstruct all the way into atheism. Some people uh, deconstruct into a broader type of spirituality, but it almost never reflects what we might consider to be historically Christian, where there's core essentials of the gospel are in place. And so um, the reason that deconstruction is so heavy on my heart right now is because it's an epidemic. Um, maybe you've seen a Christian celebrity go to social media and say, hey, I had all these questions, nobody could answer my questions, and so I'm leaving the faith, or I'm, I, I'm deconstructing, and I'm not going to stay in the faith anymore. And it's, to me, it's really tragic, because they're, they're throwing out the cure with maybe some, maybe there are some legitimate complaints about church culture or things like that, but so often they're throwing out these core essential doctrines of the faith with it. And so there have been, uh, I don't know if you all remember the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, member Josh Harris. He has deconstructed and he's now uh, proclaims to not be a Christian anymore. He's repudiated his teachings and repented for his teachings. Of, If you're not familiar with that book, um, it was a little on the extreme side. He was saying Christians shouldn't necessarily date, but they should just court and not kiss till they get married, something like that. I never read the book, but 
Is that, I, for those of you who read it, I don't know if that's a fair summary, but it was, it was very much in that whole purity culture movement, and he has since gone away from that. Um, we've seen musicians deconstruct. Um, remember the band Hawk Nelson? Uh, John Steingard, the, the lead singer, uh, same thing, went on Instagram, and he now has a YouTube channel helping other people deconstruct their Christianity. Um, and this is sad, because like some of these people, I, I toured with John, it's, it's hard to see some of this stuff happen, um, but it's an epidemic, and here's why I want to bring it to your attention as people who are, have such an influence over Gen Z. Deconstruction is different than doubt. A lot of people are very confused about what it is, and I think, honestly, as I look at social media, I think evangelical culture is trying to catch up with it because they don't really get it, um, but they're just trying to manage it. So I see articles all the time from people saying, hey, you know, yeah, you should deconstruct your faith. And what they mean is, oh, well, you should check and see that what you believe is true and hold fast to what's true and reject what's false. Um, but the people in the deconstruction movement, and it is a movement, that is not what they mean. They are talking about seeing Christianity as a toxic system that needs to be burnt to the ground. They don't want to deconstruct in your church. They don't want to deconstruct with you. They don't want to talk to you about it. They want space to essentially be able to walk away from their faith. And I've watched tons of deconstruction stories in preparation for the book I'm working on, and I can tell you what emerges every single time. And I think I can say this without exaggeration, and I can say it fairly. Deconstruction is not about truth. It's just not. This is part of what I talked to the kids about this morning. The reason I, I try to discourage people from deconstructing is because when people deconstruct, they're not looking for what's true so they can line up with what they believe with what's true. They're looking for what their hearts tell them is good. And your heart isn't always going to tell you the truth about what's good. So if a doctrine, for example, the substitutionary atonement of Jesus the idea that Jesus took the punishment for our sins upon himself, this in the deconstruction movement is seen as an abusive and oppressive doctrine. And it is discarded because it's traumatic to tell people that they're sinners and that Jesus had to be killed by God. So there, we have to be so careful when we talk about deconstruction because deconstruction and they'll outright say it. I, I've, I was on a Twitter thread last night where a couple of uh, people in the deconstruction movement were saying, you can't say you've deconstructed unless it's, and they even said, it's not about figuring out what's biblical. The Bible's gone in deconstruction. They, they do not care about what the Bible says. You're to assess your beliefs based on what you think oppress people and what doesn't. And like I said, substitutionary atonement is going to go because that implicates the moral character of God turning him into a cosmic child abuser. I know it's getting in the weeds of it, but this is, what, this is why I think this is such a big thing that Gen Z is going to face more and more, especially since COVID. Let's all be honest, they're online more. My kids are. I tried so hard. I mean, we were so good for a couple months, but it's hard, you know, when you're quarantined to school. You know, the, I don't know if you guys have had to shut down and quarantine at times, but like my son's class has had to quarantine and then, then, you know, you're just, it's hard to keep them off the screens. And so that microcosm of the entire world coming into their lives and hearts in a microsecond is just always there. And there's always something to, you can Google a question, find the answer you like, find the one that you think is good, the one you agree with, and you don't have to look at anything else. And that's why I think deconstruction is so dangerous. I'll tell you a second reason I think deconstruction is possibly the greatest faith threat to Gen Z is because deconstruction is really a vehicle, and it can go all sorts of different places. I think progressive Christianity is a huge threat to our kids, but they don't get there until they go through deconstruction first. So they might deconstruct into a progressive Christianity. They might deconstruct into an atheism or an agnosticism, Deconstruction is the exit door. And, and I think, it, so it's more about tearing down what they're coming from than, than where they're going. Now, I don't want to depress you <laughs> because, it, I mean, it sounds bleak, right? Because we're seeing this happen so often. But I, I want to stand here before you and tell you that I went through deconstruction. I didn't, I didn't want to. I didn't understand what was happening to me at the time. But when I was in that class, that pastor deconstructed me and it was painful, and it was dark, and 
I, I told my story this morning to the kids, but my faith deconstructed, but I didn't understand what was happening to me. But I can stand here and tell you that God can still reach people who have been through deconstruction. And he reached me and let me go through that so that I would have to dig in and study and be here with you today. Um, so there's hope. I know there's hope. And I'm praying for a revival among the deconstruction people. Because think about it. You've got a clean slate at that point. Well, mostly, unless they're not really thinking it through well. But, you know, if somebody comes to the conclusion that Christianity is false and they're going to try to figure out what they think now, it's a clean slate right, for the real gospel. So I, I think there's hope. I think we should be praying for our kids. But as somebody who's walked th that road, I will tell you there were two things, and studies actually show this out. There were two things that I think kept me anchored and kept me from deconstructing all the way into atheism. Number one, my parents were the real thing. They were real Christians. It's, it's weird. Now that I've reconstructed, I disagree with them on some theological issues. But they, were, they gave me the real gospel, and they lived it. It wasn't just a Sunday thing. And they loved people. They helped the poor. My mom did homeless ministry. They, this, they were real Christians. And I knew that all the people in my classes, they were deconstructing. I was like, when they would describe their upbringing or the, the encounter they had with Christianity, I was like, that wasn't real. That wasn't the real thing. So live the real thing in front of your students. They'll remember you. Live the beauty of the gospel. Let them see you filled with joy at these doctrines that make other people wince. Let them see you have peace with God and let his love pour out of you onto them. That will go so far to live that in front of them. And the other thing is that my parents weren't incredibly legalistic. And that's one of the studies that I think it was Barnett and Impact 360 showed was that of the kids who did not leave the church, there was two common traits in their families. And that was what I just said. They, they lived the authentic gospel and they were not legalistic. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, we, we throw our hands up and throw our kids to the wolves, but there's something to be said for that. There was space. There was room. And I certainly had that as well. So, um, all right, I want to, with the time we have remaining, I want to tell you a little bit about progressive Christianity. Um, because, again, that's the end road of a lot of kids who come out of church and go through deconstruction. Um, so let me see what I want to do here. Let me give you a little history of progressive Christianity. Then I'm going to show you a couple of practical ways it's manifesting itself in culture. So what are, you, are we on? Do I need to turn that back on? This here? Oh, I got to plug it in. That'll, that'll do it. Can, is it on? Okay. All right try to get this going now. Oh, and it's at the end. Hang on. Um, so progressive Christianity is a movement of people who grew up in the church. It's largely made up of ex-evangelicals. And these are people who essentially have rejected the form of Christianity they grew up with, and they're embracing entirely new beliefs. And in my book, Another Gospel, that's why I call it Another Gospel, I argue that this is not just... Um, a group of Christians who might be like embracing the messy authenticity of their lives or maybe changing their mind on some social issues. This is an entirely different message. It's a different God. It's a different Jesus. And I hope to show you that very quickly before I tell you about a couple of other things. So a little history. Remember the emergent church? Everybody remember that in the like late 90s, early 2000s? Sorry, excuse me. Started with guys like Tony Jones and Doug Paget. They formed an online hub called the Emergent Village, along with people like Brian McLaren. And uh, Phyllis Tickle was a scholar who coined the term emergence Christianity. And she predicted, you know, every 500 years or so, the church has a reformation. And she said, here we are, 500 years, this is the reformation. And so it was essentially a movement of evangelical Christian leaders who spanned the spectrum from theologically more liberal to theologically more conservative in the beginning. And they were going to assess the methods the church was using to reach 
this increasingly postmodern culture. And so in the beginning, it was more about how do we reach our culture with the gospel? But as time went on, the theologically liberal voices became louder and sort of drowned out the more conservative voices who were saying, hey, we need to have a, like a belief statement. So people, and, and the, the people on this side were saying, no, this is going to be more fluid. We're going to embrace all types of spirituality. So essentially it pushed out the conservative leaders in the beginning. And that's why today it's largely remembered as a more theologically liberal movement. Now, why am I bringing up emergence Christianity? Because here's the thing we have to understand. Uh, I see on Twitter sometimes, even still, evangelical leaders will say things like, hey, remember the emergent church? Boy, that was a flash in the pan. Like, that was here and gone. And I'm going, here and gone? It's like, it's, it's alive and well. And I was confused when I would see their posts like that because what I realized happened as I went back through the history of progressive Christianity, which is what um, was so impactful in, my, in, in a negative way in my life, is that do you all remember when Rob Bell wrote the book Love Wins, where he was asking Christians to maybe reconsider, maybe we shouldn't be holding to this doctrine of hell, and he asked a lot of questions that led a lot of people to the answer of, yeah, we should reconsider. Well, when he came out with that book, John Piper famously tweeted, farewell Rob Bell. Anybody remember that tweet? It was like, heard round the evangelical world. And, and so when guys like Piper did that, it did kind of put guardrails up around the evangelical church and, and in all, for all intents and purposes, pushed the emergent conversation out of the evangelical church. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. But that was around the time that social media was emerging. We had online hubs. We had, remember internet of like for, chat room forums on blogs and stuff. And then social media was rising. So when these more theologically liberal leaders were pushed out, they didn't go away. They reassembled online. Uh, they, they began to uh, tweet and, and, and gather communities of people online. So they essentially flourished online and then reemerged as progressive Christianity. But at the same time, these people were going to evangelical churches. So a lot of minds were being changed on the small group level. It was sort of infiltrating from the bottom up. Uh, I, I, this was confirmed by Brian McLaren, who was one of those early leaders. In 2012, he wrote a blog post and he said this. He said, I think the movement is stronger than ever. In evangelical and charismatic circles, many evangelical charismatic gatekeepers have successfully driven the emergent conversation underground. My sense is that more and more of us who are deeply involved with emergence Christianity are simply talking about God, Jesus, the Bible, mission, faith, spirituality, and life, and doing so from a new and fresh perspective, but not using the E, the emergent word, so much. Sometimes it's the word missional that works. Sometimes it's progressive. Sometimes it's a new kind of. It goes under lots of labels. So what was emergence Christianity got pushed underground, but all of these guys are still highly respected. Tony Jones uh, is still writing books. Brian McLaren is still writing books. Uh, so th these people have not gone away. They're still the leaders, but now they call themselves progressive Christianity. And then there's new faces that have been added. This is uh, Nadia Boltz Weber, who a few years ago wrote a book called Shameless. And it's about sexuality. And in the book Shameless, she defines holiness as unity between two people and unity between a person and God. Which, by the way, there's no she doesn't offer a footnote or any justification for defining it that way. She just defines it that way and uses that definition to approve of any sexual encounter that you believe helps you thrive sexually. And she says, I want, I want to see that in your life, whatever you think makes you thrive. In her book, she describes a one-night stand between two men, and she calls it holy. So we have to understand, progressive Christianity is aggressive. They're going after Gen Z kids, of course, because they're totally on board with culture when it comes to gender, when it comes to sexuality, all of those norms, they're, they're right on board with culture. Of course, I mentioned Rob Bell and his book, Love Wins. Um, this is Jen Hatmaker, who in 2016 became arguably the highest platformed evangelical leader to come out in favor of same-sex marriage and relationships. She does not identify, I don't believe, as evangelical anymore. 
Uh, Rachel Held Evans is another person who had a big influence on progressive Christianity mobilizing online during that time when it was sort of underground. She wrote a book called Inspired a few years ago where she argues, you know, we've been reading the Bible wrong for 2,000 years. And she says we need to apply filters like feminist Bible interpretations. We need to use filters like historical criticism, which, by the way, is a discipline that largely desupernaturalizes the Bible. It views the miraculous story in the Bible as, you know, it doesn't really matter if they happened. We want to mine the meaning out of these stories. Historical criticism became critical of the deity of Jesus, the uh, accuracy of the text, uh, and things like that. And then she said, we also need to read this through the, the lens of liberation theology. And so these were sort of these new lenses that she said, we need to start reading the Bible through these lenses. And a lot of progressive Christians began reading the Bible that way. Um, to define the movement is a little bit tough because it's slippery. It's like nailing jello to a wall, right? And that's because progressive Christianity is not about what you believe. That might seem strange, but there are even atheists who are in progressive Christian communities. It's not about what you affirm. Uh, you, you can have one progressive Christian who believes Jesus was resurrected in some physical sense and someone who doesn't. They're perfectly fine to be in unity together because it's not about that. It's not about what you believe. And they're not all, like a lot of people have a perception of progressive Christians that they're just trying to be cool or, or something like that. There's a lot of very intellectual, very smart, biblically literate progressive Christians leading this movement. They just, they're, they're twisting it all up in knots. But um, so to define it, it's not really about what they affirm, but as I researched the movement, what became very clear is that they're all very united in what they deny. And so this is where I'll just walk you through the points to not uh, belabor this, because I want to get into one more thing to share, share with you what I think is a big danger to Gen, Gen Z. But if we just look at the narrative arc of the gospel, and a lot of theologians frame it like creation, fall, redemption, restoration, right? So God created the world, got Adam and Eve sinning, falling, introducing sin and death into the world. Um, and then you have Jesus, God in flesh, living a perfectly sinless life, taking our sins upon himself, so that those who put their trust in him can live with him forever. And for those who reject him, they will be forever in a place called hell. So this is kind of just the basics, right? This isn't even like the, the, the secondary issues that we would maybe agree to disagree on, just the basics of the Christian gospel. Progressive Christianity denies these points on each term. So creation, actually I'm going to save that one because I want to talk about that next with this idea of the universal Christ. Um, but creation, and then we go to fall. So progressive Christians unanimously deny that our sin would separate us from God. They unanimously deny that. Their gospel message is you are already inherently united with God. There's nothing you need to do. There's nothing you need to repent for. There's nothing that Jesus needed to do. You just need to realize how beloved and united with God you already are. So there's a denial that human sin separates us from God. There's a denial of the doctrine of original sin. There's a denial that humans have a sin nature. Um, now, they're not going to deny that people do wrong things. They might even call it sin. They would definitely describe us as being sinful in a lot of our beliefs. But they don't believe sin separates humans from God. That's kind of key right there. And then we get to re redemption. Much like the deconstructionists in the mind of the progressive Christian, the idea that God the Father would require the blood sacrifice of his only son, this implicates the moral character of God, turning him into some kind of cosmic child abuser. A good God would never do things that way. And so for the progressive Christian, the cross becomes more of a symbol of Jesus showing us what it's like to submit to our bloodlust and show us how to live as a, forgive, a forgiving person, how to, how to live in forgiveness to those who, who wrong you. That's what the cross is about for progressive Christians. And then you have the resurrection. I missed that with the first <laughs> flyover. It's been a long day. Um, again, some, some affirm it, some don't. I'm going to introduce you to a, a progressive Christian leader in a moment who teaches, yeah, I believe the physical resurrection of Jesus. And then you read his book, and you see what he means by resurrection is Jesus' body decomposing and going into the ground and becoming you know, a tree that grows up out of the soil. That's what he means by physical resurrection. So got to define those terms, right? Um, so resurrection, you know, it doesn't really matter. 
And then, of course, the second coming of Jesus becomes sort of a metaphor of when you have an experience with God in this life. Um, but there's not like a physical return of Jesus that we should be looking for. And then according to progressive Christianity, they are, um, I, I have never come across one progressive Christian who's not in some way a universalist. So some would be flat out universalists. Some would take a more, what they might call a Christocentric view of universalism where they'll say, no, no, Jesus is the savior, but he's already saved everyone. So again, nothing, you're not separated from God and you know, I know none of it really makes sense together, but that's just, that's the denials. They denial, if, the, if we're going to look at what the denial is, it's the denial that there's a place called hell in any way, shape, or form. It just it cannot possibly exist in the progressive Christian paradigm. And their views of heaven are going to be very different. You know, they'll, they'll affirm different things about that. But that would be sort of the flyover. Um, I'm going to just read one quote from a progressive leader so you can understand a little better. This is John Pavlovitz. He's just written a book. If you want any kind of picture of how popular these ideas are, uh, his book, The Week It Came Out, it was number 56 on Amazon. Okay, that's out of millions of books across all genres. His book was number 56. Like we're talking, he's up against like the Oprah Book Club and he's number 56. That's how popular these ideas are. And he's a progressive Christian who defined it this way. Progressive Christianity is about not apologizing for what we become as we live this life and openly engage the faith we grew up with. There are no sacred cows, only the relentless sacred search for truth, tradition, dogma, and doctrine are all fair game because all pass through the hands of flawed humanity and as such are all equally vulnerable to the prejudices, fears, and biases of those it touched. Now, at first blush, we might look at this and say, well, yeah, I mean, we want to take whatever we read, whatever book we read or Bible study we get from Lifeway or wherever we get our Bible studies, and we want to filter that through Scripture, right? Because these are written by fallible people who might have prejudices, who might have biases, and I think we would all agree with that. But what we have to understand in the progressive Christian paradigm is that he's not just talking about like C.S. Lewis or A.W. Tozer or a devotional you might write for your church's website. He's talking about the biblical writers themselves, which really brings us to the progressive Christian view of the Bible. And this is why their uh, you know, affirmations and beliefs are so all over the place. Uh, in progressive Christianity, the Bible is not seen as authoritative. That is a denial that you see across the board. Um, some might call it the Word of God. Some might say it contains the Word of God. Uh, there was a progressive Christian church in Nashville that went viral with a meme they made that said, the Bible is not the Word of God, and just said it plainly. Um, I appreciate their honesty, because not everybody's that honest in the progressive world, but they don't believe that the Bible was breathed out by God, that it was inspired by God, and therefore authoritative for our lives. They are going to hit at all the atheist talking points about contradictions and corruption in the manuscripts, and they're going to repeat all of that stuff. Because if you can get the Bible out of the way, you can make up your own rules, right? So when a progressive Christian thinks about the Old Testament, they're not seeing the prophets of God speaking for God. They'll say, well, that was just their best understanding of God in the time and the places in which they lived. Brian McLaren uh, refers to it like a fossil. You know, you dig up a fossil, you dust it off, and then it lets you know what was going on there, what was alive at that time. Um, what kind of dinosaur is this, right? That's how they approach the Bible. So it's not authoritative. It's viewed as a human book that's written about God, not a divine book written to humans. That's pretty much universal across the board in progressive Christianity. Um, just with the couple minutes I have left here, I hope I'm not overwhelming you with too much stuff, but I want to um, introduce you to a Franciscan friar named Richard Rohr. Have you all heard of Richard Rohr? A couple people. Um, he's, he's a Franciscan friar, the founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation in New Mexico. And if there, I, I, in my view, in my research, he is the by far most influential progressive Christian leader alive. Now he's Catholic, right? So he's a little outside the box of what is typically considered progressive Christian. But every progressive Christian thought leader that I have Googled alongside his name, I have found them singing his praise. 
tweeting his material, having him on their podcasts, quoting him in their books, doing conferences with him. I, I've started to call him the progressive pope because it's just, it's, it's incalculable, his uh, influence. And here's what he had to say about the Bible. He said, the Jewish scriptures, which are full of anecdotes of destiny, failure, sin, and grace, offer almost no self-evident philosophical or theological conclusions that are always true. We even have four often conflicting versions of the life of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is no one clear theology of God, Jesus, or history presented despite our attempt to pretend there is. Now, one reason Roar is so important when it comes to what Gen Z is taking in is uh, there was an article written about how influential he is among millennials, right? Many millennials are the parents of Gen Z. And his reach into the millennial world is massive. That's his main audience. It's his main staff at his center. The main people who come to his conferences and his retreats is millennials. And um, he promotes a view called the universal Christ. Let me scroll down here a little bit to get to a slide on that. Um, do you guys remember, I don't know if you're all on Twitter, but do you remember this tweet from Kevin Max? So this is, um, remember DC Talk? What would people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus? Remember that? So um, Kevin Max, not Toby Mac. A lot of people thought this Toby Mac, Toby, Toby's good. Toby's, Toby's awesome. Um, Kevin, so the other singer, right? In... Um, DC Talk. This is the guy that's saying, what would people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus freak, right? He goes on Twitter and he says, I've been deconstructing, reconstructing, progressing, whatever you wish to call it for decades. I've been in, uh, in the Outsider Misfit Secret Club for a long time now. Thank you for welcoming me in, but I've always been here. Happy Saturday. Thank you for your comments. And then it was a flood of comments, right? The reaction was like, what? The Jesus freak guy is deconstructing? He's progressive? What's going on? And so he clarified with another tweet. I still follow the universal Christ. I have no idea how many people's blogs or podcasts are using that announcement for further division, but I'm here for the grace. And so then all these Christians were like, what is this universal Christ? Now, of course, I'd been studying the universal Christ for a long time, so I was so happy to be able to help some people understand what it is. But it's a concept that was introduced by Richard Rohr in his book, the universal Christ. And essentially what he teaches is that Jesus and Christ are two separate entities with Jesus being just a model, an example to follow of someone who has grabbed hold of and embodied this universal Christ consciousness. Now what the universal Christ consciousness is, remember I told you I was going to save the creation. It has to do with their view of creation. So the universal Christ, according to Richard Rohr and every new age teacher, by the way, this is a new age concept. The universal Christ is a, the explanation for all reality, essentially. It's everything that's supernatural is the Christ. And so the view goes that when God created the universe, he incarnated himself into physical matter, filling the universe much like a hand fills a glove. So therefore, the Christ, that incarnation, called the first incarnation, is in everything, Think about it. If God filled all physical matter with his presence at creation, then you are the Christ. You're the Christ. I am the Christ. This table is the Christ. If you think I'm exaggerating, let me skip a couple. This is a tweet from Michael Gunger of the band Gunger. Remember those songs? He makes beautiful things, makes beautiful things out of the dust. And then... Uh, Remember, I am a friend of God. He wrote that. And he recently tweeted, Jesus was Christ. Buddha was Christ. Muhammad was Christ. Christ is a word for the universe seeing itself. You are Christ. We are the body of Christ. And then, of course, there was a tweet storm. <laughs> and then he said this. Thanks for all the thoughtful replies, everyone. If you want to understand more of what I'm talking about, I would suggest The Universal Christ by Richard Rohr. Also, check out this season of the Liturgist podcast, that's his podcast, where we explore in depth how and why this tweet is true. And so you can see how influential this idea is. And in Richard Rohr's book, he never explicitly says Jesus is not God. But what he does is he implies it very strongly with phrases like, Jesus never asked to be worshipped. 
right? He'll say that, or he'll say, our tendency is to worship the messenger, right? He, and there, there are statements that I'm trying to be as charitable as possible, but there are statements you could absolutely interpret as denials of de- Jesus' deity. And this is what so many millennials are gobbling up, fr- everyone from Christian musicians to um, you know, b- people who write books. I've seen him quoted in so many books. And so I just wanted to make you aware that this is sort of what's coming for Gen Z, but it's going to come in the process of deconstruction first. And then Richard Rohr is going to give them something to put in the place of what they just tore down. And for a lot of people, it feels really beautiful. It feels like the right thing because it's, there's no judgment. It's very free. I can imagine it would feel freeing to, to feel like, okay, I have no more moral restraints on me. I'm free from all of that. But I've got to think about freedom, right? As Christians, we are free in Christ, but that's, we're free from that stuff. We're free from the bondage of sin. People like Roar and the progressive Christians and even the deconstruction movement are offering freedom to sin, which is going to put people in bondage to sin. And that's why I'm so concerned about it. Um, I'll close out with this t- uh, quote from Richard Rohr from the book. God loves things by becoming them. God loves things by uniting with them, not by excluding them. Through the act of creation, God manifested the eternally outflowing divine presence into the physical and material world. Ordinary matter is the hiding place for spirit, and thus the very body of God. So I don't want to leave you empty-handed today. Um, I have if this is all new, if you're just like, what just happened? (laughs) I want to refer you to my website. I have tons of videos. In fact, um, I have an almost four-hour rebuttal of the Universal Christ on my YouTube channel that I recorded with an ex-New Age guru who used to teach it, and he's a Christian now. And so he took four hours and refuted uh, Rohr's arguments biblically. So I have that on my website. I have lots of resources on Rohr. I have lots of resources on progressive Christianity and deconstruction. Um, So, you know, if you want, if if this is all like, wow, this is so much, don't be overwhelmed. Maybe take one question that kind of was sparked today and maybe just start going down that rabbit trail, you know? And I guarantee you, this is the thing I want to leave you with. One thing I discovered when I was learning all this stuff for the first time is it felt so overwhelming because you learn one thing and it just makes 10 more questions pop up. But every time I would learn something, it's like within two weeks, somebody would ask me about that one thing I was studying. It, it, I used to be kind of afraid to do Q and A's because I'd be like, there's so much I don't know. Do you know how rarely it is? There's so much I don't know, but nobody ever asks about that. Like, it, it's so funny. I'll be with other guys, and they'll be like, what about the bacterial flagellum in the marine layer of the evolutionary thing? And I'm like, I, you know. But nobody ever asks me that. So, like, I think God shepherds that process. And even if they did, I'd be perfectly comfortable saying, I don't know. But <laughs> he knows. <laughs> um, but I think it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, let's go on this journey together. Maybe for your own knowledge, pick one thing that you just want to learn a little more about. Um, you know, we have book clubs online on Facebook. If you know, you're old people like me, you're on Facebook, you can do a book club on there with me. Just look, look for my name online. And, um, I hope to be able to help you with whatever resources I have available. Um, but man, you guys are in the battle. Like my kids are the ages that you are reaching. And so I'm so thankful for you guys and I'm praying for you and God bless anyone that's willing to spend a whole day with a seventh grade, you know, class because... I can't wait to get my seventh grader out the door every morning. So. Thank you, Elisa, for coming. I think sometimes when we hear this idea of uh, progressive Christianity, we think, oh, that's over in California. We don't, we don't have to deal with that right here. But it's creeping into major Christian denominations. There are God-loving Christians in churches not realizing that this stuff is coming in in every direction possible. I really think Satan is trying to work his way in to churches across the country. I remember uh, at Palm Beach Atlantic back in uh, 2003, maybe 2004, they invited a fellow named Bart Campola. I don't know if you're familiar with him. 
And PBA is a Christian college, as we know. Many of us have graduated from there. Um, and I was there, and some of the things that he was sharing were shocking to me, some things I'd never heard. Universalism, we're all going to heaven. There is no hell, things like that. And we were kind of shaken. I remember just walking away like, what is this? I, I thought I was in a Christian school. Like, how do I wrestle with these things? But it did allow me to grow more in my faith, kind of chasing those questions and chasing truth through Scripture helped me to know God more and have a defense for my faith. And I think that's so important for our students. They are being bombarded with these issues more than we might hear of these issues. Maybe we don't necessarily struggle with these things as much, but our students sure are. They are wrestling with these topics. So I think this is really good information. I was telling Elisa as she came in, uh, in our family, we are big fans of Elisa Childers and my wife about, and she's here, so she came just to see you. So she's, she's got to get an opportunity. She said, I need a selfie with Elisa before I leave. So, uh, but about two years ago, she started listening to the podcast and she said, you got to listen, you got to listen. And you know, you're like, okay, yeah, eventually I will. Then she started playing it so the whole family listens. And so then I got hooked. And so now every time a new episode comes out on YouTube and you got to check it out, they're always good. And she's got the best guests that'll come on too. Uh, we, we started following and listening to. So we, we so appreciate you and your ministry and for coming and speaking to us here at the King's Academy. So I'm going to close this out in prayer. And if you didn't sign in, please do at the blue table over here as you leave. And then you are dismissed a little bit early than uh, five o'clock. So hopefully you enjoy that. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you so much that you are a good, good God. Lord, I pray that you would continually guide us to truth and help us to be truth lovers. Lord, help us as Christian educators to guide our students well, to point them to you and to wrestle with them as they battle through some of these difficulties and these, these uh, difficult questions. I pray that you would help us to come alongside them and to shepherd them to you. And we thank you for Elisa and her ministry and for the opportunity we had to listen and grow uh, from her today. And we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.